Thanks, everybody. Oh, thank you. A little, little clapping right there. Uh, I'm Ricky. Welcome to Build. Our next guests are on their third collaboration together, and it just keeps getting better. Elizabeth Moss and writer-director Alex Ross Perry began with Listen Up, Philip, moved on to Queen of Earth, and now return with Her Smell, the at-times confrontational, at-times hilarious, and at-times beautifully redemptive story of Becky something, addict, rock star, mother, narcissist, and one of the most captivating bullies to hit the screen since Daniel Plainview. Take a look. Who was Becky something? Welcome from Her Smell, <laughs> Agnes Dane, Gail Rankin, Elizabeth Moss, and writer-director Alex Ross Perry. Let's hear it, please. That was great. That was wonderful. That was true Becky something entrance there. Becky something entrance. Congratulations, you guys. I love this film uh, so, so, so much. Uh, I've always liked your work. I've always liked your collaborations. Um, I dare to say this is a huge step forward. It's not for me to say. I don't know if it feels the way for you, but... This is one of my favorite movies of the year. It's something that upon starting, I immediately thought, oh, a bunch of people got together and made a movie specifically for me. This is really great. There's a, a mean, angry, hilarious person at the center of it, and it's about 90s alternative rock. <laughs> um, so Alex, how did this start? I mean, did it start from having worked with Elizabeth and being like, I want to give her more to do? I want to I wanna work with her even more and challenge us? Um, well, there is, there is that. There is a character only there's no story there's no there's no anything there's just a character that i kind of suggested and i suggested it at a time that i had two projects that were kind of going down in flames one was a music movie set in a different <laughs> era and one was a tv pilot set in the 90s and the ashes of both of them and then the character became the movie can i ask what what was the other era that, it, that the music movie was set like in like a 60s pop movie oh okay which i didn't live through so it's good that i didn't make that movie because that wasn't really something that was my movie to make so it's, i'm glad it didn't happen and so you you I, I read that you texted her basically just the 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 germ of the character idea right which is rock star mother addict something like that yeah that's all it took <laughs> Did you have you always wanted to play a rock star of some kind? Was it something that ever occurred to you? Not really, um, not necessarily. But I, I'm not really good at like coming up with specific ideas, like oh, I want to play this or I want to play that. Um, but yeah, he sent me this text, and it was this really this little sort of germ of an idea based on this just like what about this woman? I want to write a story about this kind of woman and this woman who's an addict and also raising a very small child or a baby. And I think the original concept was it was just going to be one room, like a hotel room or a shitty motel room, and maybe one other character in it and this baby, and they'd be like really long shots um, in real time and stuff, which I don't know if you even remember. But I'm to remember it. Yeah, that like, was like the original like idea. Like, let's get lost or something. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Let's totally do that. And then, um, and then I got this script, and it was like two bands, you know, 17 characters and five acts. I was like, I'll do this one too. Sounds good. <laughs> now, where did the five act idea come from? Was that you setting limitations for yourself, or did that just feel like the best way to tell this story? Well, 
I don't know. I and mean, seeing the, all that theater too, right? Yeah, I finally got to a point in my life in New York after over a decade where I kind of knew how to and could afford to see theater. Same, like last year I started going, or like two <laughs> years ago I was like, I think one of the first things I saw was your play on Broadway. And I was like, oh, I love theater. I love writing. I should just go to the theater all the time. <laughs> yeah, that was one of them. That was kind of, yeah, that was in that kind of wind up for me. Um, but we talked about that because that play had like just eight scenes or nine scenes and each one was just kind of that. And around the time of um, kind of finding the movie, I saw The Merchant of Venice at Lincoln Center and I saw Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet movie. Um, and I became very obsessed with five act classical structure and thinking like, why are these works the foundation of all modern drama, but the structure of nothing? Like no modern drama is the structure. And then the Guns N' Roses reunion tour of that same summer, 2016. Um, and I was reading a lot about that reunion tour and somehow those two things became one idea for me. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I mistook. I thought you were gonna say there was a five act structure to the reunion tour. Well, there's a five act structure to their, to their career and, the, That's and true. the reunion tour is the fifth act. Did you and go then, see one of the, any of the shows? I went and saw two of them, yeah. You saw two of the- Yeah, of one on my birthday that summer and then another one the next year. How, how were they? Phenomenal. Really? Yeah, of course. Don't, okay. sound so, don't, don't sound so surprised. I am very, I'm very surprised. I saw footage of those concerts and I was like, oh yeah, that looks like a reunion show. No, they were great. <laughs> they weren't like a reunion show. They were playing like new stuff that they never played before. It wasn't worse. It wasn't no. like no, no, no. It was that new song that was on the deluxe edition oh. um, of Appetite for Destruction. Like they were playing songs they'd never played live before. It wasn't just the greatest hits karaoke. It was like a real set list. Um, I could go long on this. I hope we're not. I know. I'm <laughs> no, it was phenomenal and very emotional. No, but really what it was was that I was watching the show and it, the question that I had that kind of gave me the rest of the characters in this movie was just what was it like backstage for these guys to be in a green room together for the first time in 25 years? Like, what was that conversation like? Was it polite? Was it terse? I, and I just became so obsessed with thinking about the kind of... Shakespearean drama of Slash and Axel and what it would be like to just come back together. And then I was like, oh, that's how this movie ends. Now I know. Elizabeth, what uh, grounded you with this character? Because she's all over the map. I mean, one of the things that I love so much about your performance is that you find the comedy in her consistently. Even at her worst, it feels like you know how to play for laughs a little bit within that. Without, you're not mugging for the camera or anything. But what was it about her? What did you find within her that helped you ground the character and relate to her? Um, I think the rest of the cast and the other characters, like for me, it, the, the, the whole movie doesn't work unless you see the effect that she has on the people around her. Um, they're, they're, they're who you look at to see how toxic she's being or how charming or how terrible or how, whatever or in act four how vulnerable and so for me it was the the grounding part was everyone around me like specifically these two women as part of the, her band uh being able to play opposite them see their reactions to whatever i did um and to to get something back always and to they were never surprised or never thrown by anything i i threw at them which was incredible and so they grounded me, which I think helped me to kind of keep Becky in a, in a in a real place and not just you know a clownish place. Um, so yeah, it was, it was you know these two and Dan and Eric and everyone that was involved. And it's incredibly specific the script, right? There's no improv. You guys weren't improvising at all. No, zero, zero, zero improv, zero ad lib. Um, very, very specific. All of those tangents, even though they sound, because Alex brilliantly wrote it this way, it sounds like vomit. It sounds like you can't even barely understand what she's saying sometimes. If you changed a word or changed a line or reversed something, it actually really didn't make sense, which I discovered. Um, and so it was very, very specific, even specific in some of the voices and the pop culture references. And like it was incredibly specific. Now, uh, you two are the other founding members of Something She, the, the, the sort of all female fronted alternative rock band of, of, this, of this era. And you both do such a wonderful job in the first act of the, of the film, sort of setting up what is gonna happen with Becky in the way that you're both excited when she's doing okay in the moment and then exhausted immediately after, expecting both things, but still there's like a glimmer of hope each time she's just charismatic enough to be decent to you or decent to other people around you. What was it like sort of finding that balance with reacting to Elizabeth's performance consistently? Um, I don't know, should I start? Yeah. It's, it's amazing because the way that Alex set this up, like 
it was the whole like back, backstage was built. So it was like we were maneuvering around this warren and it was more like this dance, right, that we were doing. And it didn't seem like we had to grind ourselves in, oh, we should probably calm down now. It was just literally go, which you can kind of tell in the first act because also the steady cam as well, but it was, it was like chaotic. And you just kind of didn't push back on the chaos. You just kind of went, you went downstream with it. And it's like that feeling of, I know for me, playing Mario was the feeling of being in a sinking ship, but kind of being like, oh, this water's kind of warm. And this, you know, it was kind of like you, you get used to the chaos. So the first act for me was just like, this is normality. This is, and this is also fun. Like, mm -hmm. I, lo I love this chaos. I love, you know, for me, um, Gail's character was always our like mast, you know, when we've gone too far, but unless she puts the mast in, it's all free reign. So it's, Which is it was why just I'm very culpable. <laughs> <laughs> just going with the flow. And it was so fun to have that freedom. And uh, obviously, we had Alex's words and, um, and we'd put a lot of grain working together, hadn't we? Because of the, the instruments we'd all learned. And the band practice, so and we went into it. And you want it to work. It. Like, you want yeah. it to work. You want these relationships to work. There's hope there. There's, like, hope that this person is going to get it together and maybe she'll prove you wrong. And so to start the movie off with a level of, like, we're not at the end yet. But, like, we're kind exactly. of at the end, but we're not quite. We're on... Well, and if your livelihoods weren't based around whether or not she can perform, you would have been at the end a long time ago but you're just sort of putting in the hope that it will still maintain in some way yeah and we all come back and like i said like everyone in this movie in some way is culpable for for becky's destruction for our own destructive behavior like there's no even though we have like redeemable qualities and like we're not the messed up ones and whatever like everyone is enabling in some way and it's the complexities of those relationships and like how there actually is like deep, deep, deep love between these people because we try and like, there's a lot of forgiveness and there's a lot of like, but it's also a, a double-edged sword where it's like, when does forgiveness become enabling and when do you have to pull yourself away and, and what pushes people to that point? Like, what are the things that you cannot take back? Alex, I think, you know, one of the people that, one of the things that people don't uh, attach too much to this movie for some reason they forget is that it is a redemptive story and it's actually a quite beautifully redemptive story I, I found. Um, for you, when you were writing it, did you ever know or think about when you had sent Becky too far or would push the audience away too much, or is it all kind of instinctual? Hmm. Well, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I was never thinking this is too much. I still don't think that. I don't either. Uh, like, my idea of too much in a movie isn't like women with glitter on their face wearing fishnets trash talking. Like, that's not too much. That's perfect. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to call entertainment. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It wasn't like this is too much because it would never occur to me that people would conclude their judgment until the movie was over. Mm. You know, yeah. just to sort of like string you along in the first three fifths of the movie. Maybe you think we're going to do this the whole time, but as a viewer, I would always kind of intuit that the movie is going to eventually do a 180. Well, of course it has to. You can't, I mean, either that or she, you know, it's totally, it's just a tragedy at that point. Yeah, which it never needed to be. I always wanted it to be redemptive and have a Hollywood ending. Which it does wonderfully. You have, um, I mean, as you were saying, you guys shot 12 pages a day, right? Something like that? Yeah, give or take. Give or take? Depends on the day. Um, how many cameras were shooting at once? Is it usually just one? One. Yeah, we tried to have a second one every now and then. And immediately it just didn't work. There's a like scene, that. well, there's a scene like early in the movie in act one where there's a dressing room that's, you know, the size of a normal dressing room. And it's the three of you, Dan Stevens, Amber Heard, uh, Hannah Gross, Ika Darville, Yusuf Bulos, there's a baby in the room and there's a steady cam. And then having a second camera in the room was just like, at first it was like, this is smart because there's 11 actors in the room um, we'll need to capture that. And then it was like, there's actually too many people to have a second, a second area that the camera can't look. So how did you maintain shooting 12 pages a day and getting all the coverage that you needed? 
Well, we just kind of did it very quickly over and over. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, each of the five acts, we rehearsed for a full day with no filming. So day one of the shoot, we didn't roll camera. We just rehearsed and did the steps and created a sort of floor chart of where everybody moves. At the same level of energy that you no, were doing no energy. shooting? Just, no energy whatsoever. Just figuring, oh, and no wow. one's showing the characters off at all. Everyone's just thinking, like, if I go here, could there be a lighter? If I go here, like, Gail's like, I'm going to maybe go to the refrigerator. Can there be something in there that I want to take out of it? And props makes a note of that. So that means the next day when you come in, you're kind of, like, shook up. And then you can just do... 12 pages at high energy eight or nine times in four or five different camera positions and then you're done and then it all cuts together because everyone's doing the same thing every time and how was that for you maintaining becky something's erratic energy <laughs> for that for that time it was a lot it was hard it was definitely like the highest energy kind of thing i've ever done and um it was good that we had the 12 or so pages to focus on or this little section of the play to focus on every day because you knew you had to, you, could, you only had to expend this amount of energy over and over for that day so that was good you knew what you had to face from beginning to end um so that was good just for like being not being overwhelmed but um <clears throat> it was definitely a lot and especially like the first act, the first act was scary because it was, uh, was still figuring out how far to go and how fast to go and how, how just how much I had to, to do it. And how far is in how, as in how crazy and right. how high and how f speed was a big thing. And Alex just kind of kept saying faster, 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 faster. And um, George Lucas over here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> faster. Okay. It's so interesting because we don't actually see. Becky do drugs that much in the movie. We just sort of are supposed to glean that, like, yeah, she's high on something. Mm -hmm. Whereas we see we see uh, your character do drugs consistently throughout the whole movie. Was that a conscious choice on your part to make it so like we didn't know whether or not it was a speedball she'd done or coke or if there was heroin involved? It's just like she's on drugs and that's it. Well, I remember you saying like you'd seen that, like that yeah. was like something that you felt you like you had seen. Yeah, it was conscious to me in the script because this is not a drug movie. This is not Requiem for a Dream or, you know, Train Spotting or Heaven Knows What. Like this is not that. But as soon as you inject drugs in some way, yeah, like, into the story becomes a movie about those drugs. And how do you do it in a new way that hasn't already been yeah. done spectacularly? So that wasn't of interest to me. And then the, the Agnes and Lizzie solution was like, we're going to create the map of when what gets taken and what then you are feeling like two minutes later versus 15 minutes later. And then they kind of created that chart in the scripts for themselves that was kind of just a collaboration of performance, which was my thing I needed. It was like, the words are the words, but this stuff is all the characters and the actions and the energy level on page three versus page seven. That's what is, I have no idea on. That's but what the character It was based on what was in the script, though. It would be like, okay, we need to do this or behave like this or speak like this or be emotionally in this place. What would we just have done five minutes ago that would keep, that would put you in this place? Or, you know, what have you been doing for the last 24 hours that would put you in this place? And act one, two, three being all very different as far as what was being done as well. And so we were specific and then could be as kind of general right. as we wanted. Yeah, because yeah. it, it like if you we did a framework of it, which and then you can just throw it out the window as well. So it's like it also frees you up. So if you if you're actually showing something, then you have to act accordingly. So it just it keeps it ambiguous, which is also as well drugs affects other people in different ways as well. So yeah. it just it's just a freedom, a crazy freedom. Yeah. <laughs> well, keeping it, keeping it ambiguous for for Becky also doesn't give the audience an out. The audience can't be like, oh, she's doing this because of coke right now, or she's doing this because of heroin. You could just have to glean that she is an addict, whether it's a drug addict, a fame addict, a n just a narcissist, or an addiction to bullying people around her. Exactly. And just sort of ride with that. Exactly. There could be times when she maybe hasn't actually even done anything in a couple of days, and it's yeah. just she's just lost her mind. And you know that exactly, and enabled us to like have that freedom and not be like, well, I have to talk a mile a minute because I just did this, like whatever it was. That was something that I loved about Act 5, and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but that moment where everybody... I already said it has a Hollywood ending. Oh, okay, so there we go. That moment <laughs> whatever where... That, whatever you think, I think that means. <laughs> <laughs> that moment where everybody comes into the room and suddenly she's the center of attention again. And there's so clearly a part of her 
that relishes being the center of attention. It's in her bones to be the center of attention, but she's so scared of that aspect of herself in that moment. And so she's clearly on edge, not just because everybody's looking at her, but she can feel this part of herself. I mean, that was what I took from it, sort of bubbling to the surface. That is a very destructive piece of her. Yeah. Act five was the hardest for me because if I, I, but it actually worked well for Becky because I felt like I didn't know who Becky was without the drugs and the alcohol. And I kind of was like, well, it's probably what Becky's feeling too. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know who I am. I don't know what my identity is. I don't know how to play her. I, I'm not sure how to play her. And that kind of nervous energy and that feeling of being so lost and displaced, I was like, okay, that's probably actually, that's probably where Becky is in five. Like a woman who suffers from stage fright, yeah. but lives on stage. Right, exactly. And like, I don't, I, she doesn't know what her personality is anymore. When did you come up with the um, the Another Girl, Another Planet song as kind of like, it's in some ways the theme of the, the movie? Yeah, well, <laughs> I um, I love that. I've always loved that song. Me that's too. Like they're only, the only ones that's their own, like really their only song. Yeah, it's, I mean, but a lot of their others, there's a really, they have a great song called People of Today that I really like. I would check that out if you if you like them. Um, I never really knew the, the opening song. A lot of the covers in the movie changed draft to draft. And it was always just like a lyric hooking me. And then at some point in between drafts, I was just listening to stuff and revisited that song. And I thought, yeah, I mean, we have a little prologue before the beginning of the movie. But I just thought, if the first things you hear Becky say and present tense in the movie are, I always flirt with death. I look <laughs> ill, but I don't care about it. I was like, that's the roadmap of the movie. And I want those to be the first lines we hear her say. And then she says them like five or six times. She says them twice backstage and then she says them on stage and then the song starts she says them I was like I want her to repeat that refrain to the audience at the one minute mark of the movie you know um you said multiple drafts how many drafts of the script did you go through before you sent it to Elizabeth or sent it to producers mm -hmm. like three like I think you probably read the third draft right. but like that's two drafts that no one reads yeah. it's not like other people saw them those are just mine are those drafts that uh, are sort of coming out before you have found the overall structure? Or do you sit down and write once you've found the structure? No, I don't do anything until it's 95% figured out. So, like, I started writing after Merchant of Venice, after Guns N' Roses. But that was, like, 18 months after I said to you, here's this character. And it took me that long to be like, okay, now I know. Now I know Mari. Now I know Ali. Now I know Act 5. Now I know this. Now I know... And it just was, yeah, it took a long time, but then started writing it in like September and sent you a draft in March. Until things are really kind of percolated in your head and you yeah. get exactly what the movie is. The only way to avoid getting to a point where you don't know what the next thing that happens is. Right. So yeah, I gave myself all the time I needed to figure it all out. And obviously you challenged yourself in humongous ways uh, with this shoot. What was the most difficult, stressful, or for, worrying for thing? Yeah. Jeez, I mean, you should ask them that because they're all going to say it was learning the instruments and playing in front of an audience. <laughs> for me, I don't know. It wasn't stressful. It was so nice. I, I, I'll, let me think of an answer to that. I don't nothing. It was really pleasant. Well, not maybe not the shoot, but going into the shoot. What were you like? This is going to be, I'm very worried about this aspect of the shoot. Nothing. No, nothing. There was not a single person in the cast or crew of this movie that I had anything to worry about. By the time we were in the Friday before day one of Monday, I just individually was like, every single person here is going to deliver. I don't even really need to show up. I just was so confident that everyone, everyone had it under control or that the things that were not under control needed to be not under control when the camera started rolling. Yeah, I just had a real big group of people around me who I was completely confident in their ability to deliver 100% of their best work. So therefore, I felt like I had nothing to worry about. And what about learning instruments for, for, for you guys? It was amazing. We love yeah, it. it was so fun, was fun, actually. I know, Alex, you talk a lot about, like, I'll never ask another actor to learn an instrument again. But, like, it was, it was crazy. But we did have enough lead time. I mean, we had a few months before we, we started filming to, like, get lessons. And, like, it was, it was, it was tricky when we all came together because it was like, yeah, wait, 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 wait. We need to be a band now. Like, we all have to play together. It's not just, Are like, you playing? Yeah, like, <laughs> you learned us wrong. Like, like what the, <laughs> it actually helped us, I think. We were, like, we actually had to become a band. Yeah. Like, we had to learn how to be a band and trust each other. Yeah. I think we all found, too, that it was... Like the Yeah. I think we all found, too, that it was... We were better at it than we thought we were going to be. Like, our nerves about it and our feelings of inadequacy were 
in our head. And when we actually got out, when we did, we did another girl, another planet and we were so nervous <laughs> and we got out there, we did it for the first time. We all went backstage and we were like, Oh my God, that Let's was do it okay. again. Let's we had to do, do it again. again. That was like a roller coaster. And there was like a camera problem. Was that the one that was a camera problem? Yeah, was like but we didn't know that yet. But we had to go back and yeah. do it again, and we were so happy to go back and do it again. <laughs> yeah, because it was the like, end of the day, and yeah. we were like, we're only going to do this once, and then we're going home. We're, and it was yeah, like, we're so tired. We got to do it again. We're like, ah, shucks, damn, my <laughs> really. had to like rip us off the stage. Yeah. We were so excited. You guys are actually playing the song. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah we're yeah, playing. Yeah, we're we're like, playing. playing. I, I always say, like, yeah, we were playing, but, like, I wouldn't plug myself into, like, an amp or anything or turn it I up was too just loud. I was <laughs> nervous because I couldn't, like, really dampen the drums. I was really playing, for sure. Yeah. Because she was playing the drums. You can't fake play the drums. You hit them. Well, you can, but they just sound terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I did. Like, she, we could hide behind, frankly, her sound, but, like, when she, hit, like, she hits it, there's no way to like you can hear it if it's wrong so um but yeah we all got to a certain level of yeah. being able to yeah. play something it was really cool did you uh did you go back and look at videos of 90s rock stars like that uh inspired you at all for your looks or the way that you acted yeah i think we all did our own sort of thing finding as much as we could we had an email chain that everyone was just kind of send like youtube videos back yeah. and forth and, and aggie's a huge wealth of that yeah time period and she was like a researcher <laughs> yeah like more back the in 70s. The 70s when aggie was alive yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> a bit like a big punk like a wealth of knowledge of like gail and i were like a little bit we're like, like hey, wait what <laughs> the raincoat the slits but like you know we had our own you know she was an expert she yeah, was super helpful. The raincoats are awesome. So are the slits. They're really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have one of the most incredible, incredibly assembled supporting casts in this in this movie. I mean, outside of the two right here who are as well amazing, but you have Eric Stoltz, you have Amber Heard, you have uh, Dan. You're reading Evans. off the poster. They're all right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then the, the younger band in the movie, the Acre Girls, is uh, Cara Delevingne, Ashley Benson, and Dylan Jalula. How did you go about assembling all of these people? I don't know. Just by magic, kind of. Like, the script comes. I mean, you know, Aggie and Gail could probably answer this better than I could. Like, the script comes. Lizzie's involved. You read it. You picture it. You've maybe seen one of my other movies, or Aggie and I had met before on another movie, so we'd at least had some, some familiarity. And, uh, you know, you just kind of feel out who's going to be the right thing. But, you know, I don't have the luxury, and therefore I have come up without the need of like an audition or a chemistry test like it's just instinct it's just like oh that's kind of what I always thought that character would look like but I didn't know it until we met or we skyped or what have you and then you know like Eric Stoltz was like a vision I had when I was driving on the highway um I just was like what if he's in the movie that guy doesn't act anymore. I didn't know anything about him. He's I, so good in the movie. He's, he's unbelievable. Like a, he's an, he's going to be like an unsung hero of the movie because, I mean, everyone rightfully is going to talk about you guys and your performance, but when I was watching movies, like, what an anchor. Every take, everything he does is just so spot on and specific. He's the most, one of the most technically precise performers I've ever seen, and editing him is, like, you can just use anything because, like, his hand on his collar or on the back of his head is the same in every take, which is weird because he never seems like he's working or paying attention until you start rolling. <laughs> and then it's just like deliver, deliver, deliver. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just was like deliriously lucky with every single person that agreed to be in the movie. We were, out, I, I remember also being like, so excited we were both so excited and sort of surprised like people that people wanted to be in this movie like there was we, we he would say like some actress was like reading it and really wanted to meet him and we just kept being like oh my god are you serious that's so cool and it was the same with everybody that's actually ended up in the movie it was like Agnes Dean wants to be in this movie like Gail Reagan wants to be in this movie like it was like it was one after the other it was like are you serious and so I, I remember having that experience where we, like that was a little new was like people actually like were kind of more excited about it than we'd ever thought they would be. Did you feel protective of your filmmaker who this is your third project with? You're like, he's mine, <laughs> actually. Like you can be in this, but he's mine. <laughs> no, I knew I would always be like, you know, no, it's like number one. So I don't know, you're cool, right? Like that's I mean that's true, right? No, I was it was more a matter of like 
you know, wanting every single role was so important because, like I said, for me, the most important thing was the people that Becky was surrounded with. I couldn't do, I couldn't do this role. How, how large she is would have been silly and clownish if she wasn't supported by actors and actresses who were just as strong and just as present and, and just as important. And so for, for me, it was, it was a matter of like every single part, no matter how big it was, had to be the best possible person we could get. So it was just really picky. It doesn't surprise me that people would want to be, would see this script and want to be involved. Like on the face of it, you know, a 90s alternative rock band fronted by women falling apart is just a great log line. And then the script being five great scenes, just five great scenes is like a wonderful read. I would imagine the script itself was just so much fun to read. Yeah, for totally. sure. Holy, I mean, I'm sure, I think, feel like that was your experience. It was certainly mine. I was like, wait, this is like a poem. Yeah. It was like Alex had created another language. It was like, like this punk. Like a play. Punk... Like plays are fun uh, to read. Absolutely. Script, not, movie scripts are not. So no, no. And the la like there's amazing soliloquies. There are like soliloquies in this movie where you're just like, oh, I'm reading. It's like reading a play. I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Someone is walking up behind me right now. Hi. Hi. Um, this question is for Elizabeth. Um, I wanted to ask, with such an intense role, did you have difficulty after you were done filming kind of like getting out of that role and how did you cope with it? No, I was super happy to get out of it and leave it behind. <laughs> and and I, I finished the film on a Saturday with uh, Act 4, Saturday night with Act 4, and I started another movie on Monday. So I didn't have any time for any of that. Like, I can't get rid of the character. I didn't have time. I had I just had to go straight into to something else right away. Um, so And I was ready to let go of her. I was, I was you know, I was definitely like, okay, we're enough with Becky. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> Uh, next question. Hi. Um, I guess uh, for Elizabeth, but all of you, um, you're specifically so good at getting into extreme characters like an Us and Handmaid's Tale. Like, what is your process for getting into, or for getting into Becky? I know you just said you left her, but um, just getting in that zone of just, did you research? Did you guys, um, other than looking up the clothes and stuff like that, I guess, other stuff you did? Thanks. Uh, it. it it sounds like an easy answer, but it's just true. I, I followed the script and the, I followed the map. It was it was all there uh, in 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 Becky. I could have honestly not looked at any. I could have not looked at anyone and just followed the script. Um, I you know that's that's why I wanted to do it so badly. It was just it was this brilliant brilliant character that was fully outlined in the script. Yeah, no. And then you you have it. You have all these words, and then it kind of come. You hope that it comes together magically when you put everything on, and then you can actually say the words when the camera's going. And all of a sudden, all the stuff that you've kind of been unconsciously thinking, like, how does this person walk? And for like Mary, I was like, oh, basically, she's a bloke. She's not a woman. She's a bloke. And then I was like, okay, there we go. That's that's it. So it's like that was your way in. Yeah, yeah. finding <laughs> something that's like your <laughs> secret way in. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like almost, you know, like to answer that, like in a way, like Lizzie might have had it a bit easier, even though the character is so much more extreme, because like in the writing of it, and I like, I just felt like I was transcribing the subtitles for a performance I was already watching her give. So therefore I was like, in the script, it's like, she, like her her eyes do that like this is the color of her eyes and like she looks up and I was like I know her height I know her physicality I know that she'll be looking up at that person whereas other performers the script was not written to that so like it was just written in like the way I knew you would like move and everyone else kind of had to then like look at it and say how do I get into this whereas for you it was like yeah, her blue eyes do this, and like her hair does this. I, I do remember being on the phone with Alex at one point when I, I, I was in Toronto filming, and all of these conversations, any rewrites, anything with Aggie and Gail was all happening while I was in Canada, not actually physically in anyone's presence. And I remember saying to him at one point, like, you know I actually haven't spoken the words. I have not actually been this, I haven't said this out loud, ever. I've never actually been this character out loud only in my head. I was like, and I, I said to Alex, I was like, I actually don't know who, what it is yet. And it was only in retrospect and being asked questions in interviews that I can say, oh, I followed the map. Um, at the time, I sort of was like, <laughs> I guess it'll just Here come out. <laughs> yeah. Dive in and I'll just start saying happens. the words. Yeah. It's like being asked to do the full, the first performance of a play without 
with only one day of rehearsal yeah, or exactly. like a few months of just thinking about it, but you're not actually allowed to rehearse. Here's your costume. Here's your, your eye makeup. Yeah. Go ahead. But not to compliment you too much, but isn't that the sort of the sign of really great writing is that like the writing can kind of carry you. You know, your performance will be will be pulled out because the writing is there. Absolutely, and any work that we did on the on the script before was was mainly for me. So much about Act One, she needs to be here. Act Two, here, and Act Three, here, and just differentiating those acts so that when we landed in each act, I knew exactly what where she was supposed to be. Um, but that was the the prep work that we did. Yeah, I learned. I learned working for Disney on Christopher Robin that most scripts don't have like paragraphs of description about what a character is feeling in between certain lines of dialogue. Did all your scripts? But mine, well, do. mine do. I mean, so, so I didn't know that. Scripts are like actually really cool to read. They're like the the paragraphs are really interesting. The descriptive ones, yeah. So I don't. I, it didn't occur to me that that was abnormal. But it would for every character. It's like. She thinks, like, she considers telling Becky what she really thinks, which would be this, but instead, and then it's like a colon, and then it's the next line of dialogue. It's just sort of me being like, there just has to be these other performative moments that are nonverbal that I don't know how to do because I'm not an actor. That's so interesting because they tell writers oftentimes in playwriting classes or screenwriting classes not to do that because you're limiting what your actor can kind of come up with and what, what they can do. You have to be good at it. Yeah. 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 I don't think I don't think you're yeah. <laughs> sophistication and and also Alex is extremely collaborative too. It's not like if there was a beat like that and we were like, I'm gonna do that, but I'm also gonna maybe do this a little bit yeah. too. That you're gonna freak out or you know you're not. And it's not a matter of writing like she's sad or she's disappointed or she she feels disappointed or whatever. Like Alex will write like this is the worst, most disappointing, heart wrenching, shattering moment of her life. And so you're allowed to play that however you choose to play it. What does that mean to yeah, you? Yeah. Like, right, that actually means something, whereas like she's sad doesn't really mean Or she that sighs much. or she groans or whatever it is. Like he won't tell you what to do with it, but this is what she's this is what just happened to her in her life story wise. Yeah, one thing I like to write in, you know, the action description of a script is this is painful. <laughs> I, I like I like that one a lot. To watch. Yeah, yeah. Like this is a painful this is a terrible, painful moment. Yeah. But like I don't know what that is. Um, so it's not like restrictive. It's more like, I think it's like only focus on this stuff. Like, don't worry about like making a thousand decisions, make like the big decision, but know that like, this is the lane to be in. But then there's so many other ideas. Like there's a thing in the movie where as written, it, when the acre girls are playing a song as written, it was like Becky dances around. She loves this song, so on and so forth. And on the day you were like, I've been watching drug movies. I looked at Goodfellas. I looked at Boogie Nights. I kind of want to do this seated. I think maybe if we play this like Jesse's girl shot on Dirk Diggler and Boogie Nights, something like that, maybe Becky's seated at this moment and that way the dialogue, which we'll get back to as written, will seem much more surprising when she loves the song because you don't see her loving it. And we were like, yeah, that's great. Like now you've changed the scene essentially by deciding based on your reviewing of the material this morning to not do this the way it's physically written, but the, the, the meaning is all the same, but you're right, playing it seated is, is a much smarter decision that I didn't know when I wrote that. It's so interesting, does she love the song? I know I have to wrap it up, but I know I'm curious. Does she love the song? I think she knows it's, it's very good. Right. Um, I think she knows it's, it's better than anything she's been hit. doing lately. Yeah. And she knows it's a hit, and she knows that this is the new generation that she's not a part of. And so I think part of the reason why I wanted that like one single shot is because I felt like there was the only way that I could communicate all of the feelings that she had to go through, which was admiration, severe, jealousy. painful jealousy. <laughs> and then also this deep, deep sadness that that part of her life was gone and she would never be that. She would never be that again, you know? And she, was she ever that? And then I'm going to destroy these people but now I'm going to pretend that I love the song. And just to like be able to go through all of those emotions, I was able, because we are good collaborators, to ask Alex, like, can you give me this so that I can show that? Because dancing around won't do it. And then, yeah, well, it's a beautiful moment. And then you'd pull your classic no blinking for 50 seconds at a time trick that we love, <laughs> yeah. and then it becomes even better. <laughs> it's my favorite, it's, it's Alex's favorite trick of mine. It's a great, it's a great. You don't blink? It's in her toolkit. I'm capable of not blinking for a while. Do you start crying because of it, or do you just, or do your eyes Not water? if I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, it actually happened on Queen of Earth, and I, it worked, I, I don't think it was on purpose in that moment. That was just discovered in the edit. It was discovered in the edit that I had The shot of blink. Queen of Earth that's going from your face to Waterston's face? No, no it's, it's like a, it's a laying oh, okay. bed. On, and but it's, it's like a going in really slowly. It's like a 75-second zoom that in the edit we were like, wait, does she not blink for 75 seconds? <laughs> and then in this movie, in that shot, in the recording studio, it's like 45, 50 seconds. And we were like, she's not blinking again. This is another one of those. <laughs> um, guys, I love the film so much. Congratulations. I, I had, so, I've Thank seen you. it three times. I love watching it. It's so much fun. It's so heartbreaking. And uh, it's really beautiful. It's in theaters right now, right? People can see her smell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in New York and New York. Toronto today and this weekend. Yeah. And then next week, it's... LA on the 19th. Amazing. Go see it in theaters. It's an incredibly cinematic movie, uh, a really, really great film. And give them a huge round of applause for being here today. Let's hear it. <laughs>